Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. I am, well, back or here with Mr. Kerry Brown. How are you, Kerry? I'm doing great. We got a good one tonight. Um, I'll do a little intro. I put together a few notes just of what kind of inspired this show. But for those of you out there who don't know who Art Bell is, um, I don't even know. Would we call it paranormal radio, Kerry? Do you think that would be fair or what would you call it? Uh, that's, that's the term, um, that's, that's used more commonly these days. I remember Art used to call it, uh, especially once he was on satellite radio, he called it extraterrestrial radio. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. That is so good. So, so oh, we got, uh, for, uh, Renegade Butcher just come up and said, for whom the bell tolls. So a couple quick things I want to get out of the way, guys. First off, if anybody's listening and you're a Twitch user, Give me a follow over on Twitch. We've been streaming there for a few months now, and it's growing very slowly. But what's really exciting tonight, just to make sure it's working, is if anybody's on Rumble, and you can let me know, we're officially streaming on Rumble. And I thought, hey, if I'm going to go balls to the wall, we're now streaming on Twitter as well. So it is what it is. We got a Sean Ryan in here says, Art is the goat. Yes. Yeah, Art. Ah. Anyway, I so I got to say, I've only really known of Coast to Coast and Art for about a year. But Carrie, you have fond memories of listening to him back in the day, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I found Art when I was working a uh, third shift security job when I was in EMT school. And it was an incredibly boring job. And it, I was very grateful to find a radio show that kept me engaged and kept me awake for at least three or four hours of that shift. So uh, here's the thing. in So... He, you know, he was big in the 90s and early 2000s. And for those who don't know, his show was called Coast to Coast AM. He started in radio back in the 70s, worked his way up. It was called, I forget what he originally called it, was West Coast AM. And in 93, they renamed it to Coast to Coast. And it must have taken some, uh, some cloak on his part because originally he broadcast out of, um, a studio in one of the major casinos in Las Vegas. And he went to his bosses as the story goes. And he said, I'm moving back to my town, which is in Pahrump, Nevada. I'd never heard of it before I started research and art. And he said, I'm going there and you're going to build me a antenna and I'm going to broadcast from there. And I guess he had just enough pull with the network execs or whatever that he was able to get away with it. And while he was there, he launched or founded uh, Perumth radio station, which was called, uh, oh, I had it written down here, oh, K-N-Y-E. He called it in the Kingdom of Nye, and the tagline at the time was, things that go Perumth in the night, and I thought that was kind of cute. So he since sold it to a lady named Karen. I actually reached out to her a while ago, which was so funny. I haven't, I never heard back, but I'm like, I just sent a friendly email, and I said, hey, uh, you don't know me at all, but I would love to have you on the show because I just love to hear your story, the story of the radio station and some stories about art, because, you know, uh, it would be really cool. He seemed like he was a guy that publicly kept to himself. You know, he, he was out there on the radio a lot, but as far as he didn't, didn't seem like he had a lot of real close connections and that sort of thing. So it'd be neat to hear some stories from behind the scenes, you know? And okay. Sean Ryan says he also, yes, he had dreamland midnight in the desert. Um, which one there was, one of those was on Sirius for only about six weeks. And then he... Dark matter. That dark matter. Thank you. Boy, see, I'm glad I have Carrie here. So Useless information. <laughs> no, man, this is fun. Uh, so for the for those out there like, what the hell are these guys talking about tonight? First off, you know, it is the Workshop Podcast, which means I named it. And uh, we can talk about whatever the hell we want to talk about. Right, Carrie? Exactly. But, we got to have some way of entertaining ourselves in the workshop. Absolutely. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, this evening, I don't have a wood fire going, but we're doing good. But So I grew up uh, listening to AM talk radio. I'm not really sure why, but I always had it on, or my dad always had it on. So whenever you go in the shop, he always listened to Talk of the Town on uh, 9.30 a.m. out of St. John, New Brunswick. And there was a guy on there named Tom Young, and it was the first time. Do you ever listen to somebody on the radio for a lot of years, and then you finally see their picture, and you're like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Happened with me yeah. with Jack too. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Tom Young, like, like me, I always say I got a good face for radio. Right. And uh, Tom Young had a great face for radio, but 
he had a great voice for radio. And dad always used to tell me the story where I grew up on the East Coast. They had the Groundhog Day storm in the mid to late 70s. It was basically a blizzard in February. Nova Scotia is, I want to say, about 100 miles wide. And they had salt spray on the back sides of the trees from the far coast. So we're talking 100 miles across. I mean, telephone poles, dad's area was out of power for 10 days. Some of the other places, two, three weeks. So anyway, he, he got famous for his coverage there. And I think I picked up some of my libertarian mindset from him because he was very much open on the idea of um, limiting government overreach. So I always appreciated that. So that's where it started for me, for sure. Did you ever listen to any other anything other than uh, art as far as talk radio and that sort of thing goes? I never had any interest in any of it. And I worked um, in high school. I worked in a restaurant where there was always like sports talk radio. And I hated it. Now, I do remember um, dad would play uh, the John Boy and Billy show on okay. the classic rock station when he'd be taking us to school. And, um, you know, that's one of those shows where they still get away with everything, which is kind of great. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I enjoyed those skits, but I, I could not do political commentary or I still can't today. So, so when art came about, it was ideal. Um, Josh, the renegade butcher said, I wasn't allowed TV for a lot of time as a kid. I had a little crystal AM radio, ran off a nine volt battery. I'd hide and listen to art on late at night. That is cool. I, I For me, so in the 90s, I was all into paranormal everything. I remember I used to buy these magazines that would be about uh, spontaneous human combustion, aliens, and all of that. And uh, of course, I was a huge X-Files fan. So oh, yeah. I really wish I'd have found art back in the day. Were you into that? Did you watch X-Files at all? Or oh. was that my heart, Jillian Anderson. I knew you were gonna. I know, me too. Oh, yeah, yep. that's where the redhead thing started, right there. But yeah, I love, I love that show. And mom likes weird stuff too, so we would watch weird TV shows together of that nature. I always love. I don't know where it came from because there was no one in my family who did. But man, I would. I mean, I digested everything. But there, A uh, and E and different um, Discovery had a lot of that weird stuff when I was a kid, so I'd watch it all the time. And Sean said, I meant to mention that, yeah. So before pre-93, Art basically talked about politics. So here's a question, Carrie. Um, how much you how much do you think that Art talked about? Like, okay, when he had guests on, I, I feel like he was always very much he gave everybody their say. He was very open. He didn't judge anyone. But how much of what he covered or how much of what he brought on there do you think was either I hate to use the word staged but perhaps a little tongue-in-cheek do you know what I mean yeah I think art was probably relatively agnostic when it came to believing what his what the guests and the callers had to say but he was so good as an interviewer and as a conversation maker yes that you know he didn't insult people he didn't you know come down hard anybody but but he would also like if you learned his uh, speech patterns, you would catch like his quips and uh, changes in tone and things like that. So, yeah, I don't think he was um, a true believer in anything. I think he was just interested in everything. And it sounded like it, it's kind of weird to listen to. Um, I've been listening. I went through and listened to a ton of his Ghost to Ghost episodes. So for those who don't know, every year on Halloween, he would rename the show Ghost to Ghost. And for a lot of years, he would take calls without a screener. And for anybody who doesn't know, of course, a screener is a person who screens the calls to make sure you're not a whack job. And for someone to take live calls like that without a screener is unheard of, even back in the 90s, for the most part. Mm -hmm. So he would get the best ghost stories on there every year. You know, it was his show four or five hours long. I, I can't remember. But it. so, he, yeah, yeah. It, most of these recordings I've listened to are just shy of four hours long. And they're entertaining, you know, you'll get the occasional wanderer on there who's like, can't tell a story. And you can tell Art's getting just a little impatient. And so, mm -hmm. he, you know, he, he just, like you said, he had a way of, of course, he was a slave to commercial breaks, which I think, which from what I've read about him, he absolutely hated. Yeah. But he was very good at keeping people 
uh, in, in check and in line, keeping his time going, but also giving people, if it was a good story, he would hook them and say, hey, come back after the commercial and I'll keep the person here. Yeah. But yeah, he was he was great. And so he, let's see, he ran the traditional idea of ghost, or coast to coast from 93 till, <clears throat> I believe it was 2003. And then from then on, it seemed like he retired about every other year, didn't it? I, when I was reading through his bio, I think he retired four times for a, a different reason every time, but he just, he just kept coming back. Even if it was in a limited capacity to host on the weekends or he started his own shows on Sirius XM. And then, um, as basically like an internet, you know, podcast style, uh, you could tell like it was, it was just in his blood. He just couldn't stay away from it. Even with like family issues and different things that happened. It was cool. Um, I had, as you know, uh, Bill or William Fortune on there, the author of One Second After. And he said he was on live on the air with Art the day that he reported gunshots at his house. So there was that was the one uh, one of the times that he ended up retiring because somebody came by and fired off a gun. And uh, I thought that was a pretty cool story to hear because, uh, yeah, I don't that that's one of those stories everywhere you read about Art, it kind of sticks out and comes up, you know? Yeah. But um, for those out there who want to know more about art and coast to coast and all that he does, pretty much as Carrie's found too, everything's out there. But I found I'm a sucker for Reddit. You ever go on Reddit, Carrie, at all or not? A little bit. I use it a little bit. So there's a Art Bell subreddit that has, you know, six or eight posts a day with comments all the time on there. I actually posted earlier today because there's a story I wanted to share in here. And I couldn't find it. I didn't get, uh, I got a couple of responses, but nobody was quite sure. But um, it was one of the ghost to ghost stories I really enjoyed. And when I get to it, uh, Nate LeMaster, uh, he'll really enjoy it for a certain reason. But we, we won't say it now because then we'll all have to drink. So, <laughs> so um, I, I want to read. So I picked out a few YouTube comments about his, uh, on a couple of the videos we're going to watch. Mm-hmm. And they just kind of sum up. They're very similar. It seems like, at his popularity, they said he was on 500 stations with over 10 million nightly listeners, which today would never happen, of course. They said the new version with uh, George Nury has about two and a half million listeners. I Have you listened? Have you tried listening to him at all? Not in a long, long time, but I did back in the EMS days, and it's just not the same. It's just not the same format anymore. Sean says Art believed in Ouija boards and he wouldn't touch one again or even discuss it. And Art had something for red eyes. He said they creeped him the hell out. And that was something I wanted to mention. It Listening to all the ghosts to ghosts, it seemed like Art really, you know, I couldn't get a feel for his religious beliefs or his afterlife beliefs, but it seemed like he was really searching for what happens after you die? Did you ever catch that or? Yeah, it was a common theme. Um, he brought on <clears throat> all kinds of people to discuss that topic. And I wonder if that was a personal thing for him or if he just got interested in it or, you know, it, it's weird because we all come at life and death a different way, but it was definitely a common thread that goes through any and all of his episodes, especially with his more, um, you know, more adventurous guests and, of course, the uh, Ghost to Ghost episodes. Oh, yeah. Uh, Renegade says he has uh, whiskey for the ham comment for when that uh, comes up later on. So, <laughs> um, Yeah, so here I, I got three comments so people can kind of get a feel for it. But I uh, said, um, I was a trucker. I drove country overnight. This dude, talking about art, made my life at the time so enjoyable. Listening to his show while driving under starry skies all over the country was an amazing experience. God bless Art Bell and all the great memories. The next one was, I was a deputy sheriff in Miami for 31 years, working the midnight shift (laughs) for most of those years. Listening to Art Bell was probably the best thing about working midnights. As a deputy sheriff in Miami for 31 years, working the midnight shift for most of those years, I was always listening to Art Bell. And then the last one, this is a good one. This reminded me of Renegade. I remember laying in bed at 1 a.m. as a kid, with a tiny radio speaker under my pillow so I could listen to Art Bell, so many memories. And it seems like so many people, I mean, we all talk about nostalgia now anyway, but every time people wax eloquently about art in the comments or on Reddit or anything, 
it was always how he helped them pass the time late at night, mm -hmm. whether people had insomnia, whether they were truck drivers, EMS, <laughs> doctors, you know, night stalkers at a grocery store. And uh, I'm going to venture to guess that some of the topics covered on this show were the first time some people ever heard some of this stuff. It was the first time I heard quite a bit of it. I mean, that's what really, you know, kind of opened my mind up to realizing that the world is a much interesting place than I thought at, you know, in my early 20s at the time. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he talked about, um, what was it, uh, mental projection? I can't remember what that, you know, being able to take your break. And, you know, <clears throat> here's the thing. Again, we're going to be, at least I'm going to be agnostic about most of this. I may come a little bit more on the realist side as we talk about some of the guests, just because some have more credibility than others. <laughs> but, um, you know, Art always had, like you said, an agnostic approach to any of these topics. You know, whether it was Ouija boards, whether it was life after death, whether it was near-death experiences, aliens, all of that. And Sean Ryan, man, it's good to have you in here, Sean. Uh, he said Art spawned a generation of conspiracy theorists. So here's a question. Uh, what do you think Art would have thought of the last almost three years, Carrie? I was thinking that's what was running through my head the whole time I was prepping for this show. I would love to know. I mean, they, you get asked the question, you know, if you could talk to any person living or dead, I, I think it might be Art Bell. Um, <clears throat> so, so I read or I, I listened to most of a show that was the day after 9-11. And of yes. course, at that time, you know, we didn't know a lot. Right. And there's still a variety of opinions on what really went down and why that day. But um, I didn't pick up on any that are suspected anything other than the official report. Okay. But later on down the line, you know, many, many years later, you find that he's questioning things. So he might have, you know, bought the official version of things early on. Um, but I would think uh, he was, you know, he's pretty discerning. So I would think maybe at some point, uh, at least after a year or so, Art would have been like, this is kind of weird. <laughs> let's uh, let's let's dig a little deeper into what we're being told here. I would hope that because he was he was definitely a researcher and he put in his time on that. Most definitely. Where do you think his I, I've the one thing I've struggled with, and I think it's because he was so damn agnostic with beliefs. Where do you think where did his politics fall? Do you believe? I want to say at one point he described himself as like a libertarian or like a conservative libertarian. Okay. And there's also a, um, I am not a hundred percent on this. This could have been a comment that I read, but he, um, he, he seemed to have kind of like a, uh, a, a, a live and let live attitude. Like, right. You know, uh, he didn't seem to get all that tore up over what people did in the privacy of their own homes and lives. So. And it's hard because when you look back on somebody like that, you, at least me personally, I, sometimes I subconsciously read my own beliefs into what he talks about, you know? So of course you hear the things that mesh with you. So it's good to talk to somebody else about that because I really did get a libertarian bent from him, but I thought it would be nice to, to hear for sure because <clears throat> I listened to an episode a while back that he did on, I think it was the Montana militiamen. And they were, yep. yeah, like Freeman, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was very negative toward them. Whereas some of the other, you know, like Ruby Ridge, especially he talked about where he wasn't so negative on uh, the Ruby Ridge incident, you know, he, so it was interesting because he would take it on a case by case basis as well, where he would judge people, I think based on their intentions as well. Yeah. And Sean said, uh, Art wrote a book called The Quickening that predicted a lot of the current events. He, he used that uh, that idea. I heard him talk about it quite often. And I think he might have been yeah. a little ahead of his time with it, but I, I think it's kind of happening. <laughs> it's He did. And I actually, I, I read that book about a decade ago, and then I revisited it maybe a month or two back. And it is, it will give you chills. It is the guy understood trends and right. there's a lot of like futurists and people of that nature. And I think because, I think because he, 
curated information from so many different sources and paid attention and didn't just like judge outright, just took in the information. He was on to a lot of stuff. And uh, I, I, I recommend uh, picking up a copy and taking a look because you'll kind of be like, whoa, that's I got um, it. He and really he he made better and more accurate predictions than most people he had on the show who were there to make predictions. <laughs> I was thinking that exact thing when you're just talking about that. So. Yeah. Um. So I was in researching for the show tonight. I realized or I read that. So we're going to talk about one of the more famous call-ins, an Area 51 tie-in. So mm-hmm. for the record, three months ago was the 25th anniversary of that call. So I thought that was kind of cool and also crazy how fast time travels, hey? Uh, no, no kidding. Speaking of time travel, and we'll get to that too tonight, So <laughs> I think. Oh, yeah, my favorite. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to mention a couple quick things here, guys. We're going to bring up – we're going to – okay. I don't know how well this is going to work. I know you'll be able to hear the audio. Uh, I don't think we'll get shut down for playing any audio. We're going to talk about it as it plays, probably about two minutes per clip. I may get a copyright strike after the fact, but I don't imagine we'll have any issues live. But if by weird, some weird coincidence it does, there's lots of other feeds you can go on for it. But I think we'll be fine. So I've, I've done this before, never had any issues, but just throwing it out there for everybody in case something does happen, like a famous uh, broadcast interruption, right, Gary? Right, so. yeah. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Um, so this, I don't know if this would be Art's most famous call, but between this one, I would say this would be the one that's probably made it over into popular culture the most. Hey, Carrie? It Mel's Hole is all over the place. You can just search that and not even throw in Art Bell or Coast to Coast in your search, and you're going to find it has hundreds its own, of articles. And, yeah. It has its own goddamn Wikipedia page, so that tells you something. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to play just a little bit. If, if people out there have never heard this before, I hope it comes through nice and clear. Uh, I don't want to spoil it, so let's just play. I'm going to play about two minutes of it, and then we'll, we'll talk. Feel free to talk anytime you want to, Carrie. Uh, the bottomless pit in Washington. Mel's Hole. The bottomless pit. elderly. And let's go back. Sorry, guys. A little... For this hole? Well, the hole, the hole has always been there. We've been out there for a couple of years now, and... Uh... You know, the hole has been there since we've been there. It's been there since the previous owner was there. And the previous owner there was quite elderly. And I, I'd say he was there for a good 30, 40 years before we moved in. Wow. And then... Uh, and so there's been a thing of throwing stuff down this hole for a long time. Oh, yeah. Long it's, long it's, been, it's, been, it's been going on, you know, <laughs> it's, it's for as long as the hole has been there, I assume. When nobody knows that, I guess. All right. Uh, how do you pronounce the name of your town, Manistash? Uh, oh, Manastash. Manastash. Right. So I'm going to pause it there for a minute. So we'll fill you in a little bit on the background. So the name Mel's Hole sounds really funny nowadays, of course. But it, um, so Mel lives where a place, okay, yeah, he said, uh, perfect. Uh, Renegade said the audio is good. So Mel's Hole is basically a hole in the ground that not everybody knew where it was. Apparently the local community did. Apparently it was, would you say bottomless carry or pretty damn close? Yeah, he said he ran something like 80,000 feet of fishing line down into it and still couldn't find the bottom. So there is that. Um, and the I'm checking my notes here. Yep. Uh, I think this was supposedly in Washington State. That's right. Yes. Okay. I, yep. And so he called that that clip that you brought up is the first time he called in to art he called in several times over the years and one of the stories that mel described was that his neighbor threw a deceased dog into the hole right and mel later saw the dog alive a la pet cemetery yes yeah yes okay (laughs) and apparently the locals used it as a garbage hole. Yeah. yeah. Literally anybody would walk up and throw things in. And of course they never had to deal with it. And we're also going to talk about another famous hole a little later on. I don't think Carrie knows about this one. So this one would far, if you guys have ever heard about the world's deepest hole in Siberia, if, if you believe what Mel said, <laughs> this would be 
not infinitely, but way, way deeper than what anybody had ever dug or drilled or anything. So there was um, a few, a lady I heard on one of the ghost to ghost episodes who supposedly lived in Northern uh, Ontario. And she had a hole like that as well. So lots of people, <laughs> uh, Renegade Butcher says, Tim knows about a hole that Carrie's never heard of. So that's good. <laughs> Got to leave it to Josh to bring those. Yeah. Every single time. Every time. <laughs> okay. So if you listen, I hate to be the guy who, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, Carrie. Because All right. Mel's whole, this this entire, and I think Art got a lot of traction with this story. But when you listen to it, boy, it's, you almost, you can hear the guy laughing at times, like chuckling to himself, eh? Yes. Did you notice that as well? Yes, especially on like a second or a third listen. Because the first time I heard this story was... Um, it was on a CD. I signed up for the newsletter, print newsletter that Coast to Coast had back in the day. Wow. And with your first, I wish I still had those because there's probably not very many out there. They probably, most people probably threw them away. Um, it was called After Dark, the yeah. After Dark newsletter. Okay. They sent, the, with your first issue, they sent a CD and it had the story of Mel's Hole. Was, I think that was like one, you know, one portion of it. And, um, on that first listen, you know, I, I, I just bought it. Like here, I have this thing where I tend to believe, I want to say, I don't disbelieve things I hear. I give everything a fair shake upon first listen. And then I will go back and I will apply my BS filter after the fact. And yes, you can hear him that it's starting to sound a little bit like a crank call, especially on some of the later ones where he's called in, you know, two or three years later. A crank call or maybe... Now I don't, I, and I, I would love, I wish I could pick somebody's brain who really knew art, but it almost feels like the two of them were in on it together. The, what do you yeah. think? Yeah. There's, I, there's a rumor. There's a rumor that art would plan this out with some of his radio buddies mm. and, you know, people he, he, he spoke with on the ham and everybody take a drink now. And, um, <laughs> there you and, go. And, and they would, they would, they would create these characters because it, it made good storytelling and ultimately art was a storyteller. So I have no problem with that. It was entertainment. So, and that, okay. That's what I wanted to ask you. Like I said, we, we talked a few minutes ago about like how much of this was real and how much was, was staged, but here's the thing. Does it really matter? Like that and that, I mean, I don't know. It was entertaining. It it kind of at times smacks of um, War of the Worlds. Was it, when was that in the '30s when War of the Worlds played on the radio and yeah. everybody thought it was real? Yep. So it was entertaining. Some of it is so almost satirical that you'd think, how would anyone believe it? And then lots of it is, and I think tons of people who called in were absolutely genuine and were telling stories to the best of how they remembered it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I love hearing about this stuff, but my, when you listen to Mel's Hole, and I, it, I mean, it's the most famous one to start with, so it's fun. But um, yeah, and uh, Sean Ryan says they said uh, the same about uh, some of J.C. Weber's calls as well. Oh, I can't wait to get to him. Yeah. <laughs> and it, yeah. So, and, and it's okay. Like, that's what's cool about it is, you know, if it was, if it was theater, it was good theater. And if it yeah. was fun... It was spontaneous. It was good spontaneity. And I watched a video recently about some of the early UFC fights. And they said, uh, possibly, some of them were, were rigged or fixed. Now, whatever. Now, wherever you land on the thing, it doesn't matter. But what they said was that it would only be fixed on one side of the match. So the guy who lost knew he was going to lose. But the guy who won didn't know the other guy was going to lose. So there was only one person in it that actually knew. So I thought that was kind of plausible deniability, you know? Yeah. And with, you know, with the way these, these stories are being spun on the show, there's, there's no harm being done. No. You know, this, this isn't like yelling fire in a crowded theater or something like that. You know, it's just, it's just all in good fun. And if people choose not to practice discernment and believe things that are a little out there, well, then, you know, that's, that's on them. Boy, sometimes Josh comes out with a real gem. Uh, you know, I, I don't want his head to get too big, but Renegade Butcher says, 
It was like campfire ghost stories made into a radio show. That's what it felt like every night, you know, and it felt like a conversation. I love, I'm so glad you, I'm glad you came on here, Carrie, because you have the, the, the real time memories of him. And I think that that's cool. I like how you, yeah, you can interject that kind of stuff. So I brought up, there was a few things in uh, the Mel's Hole article and that sort of thing, but said local news reporters who investigated the claims found no public records of anybody named Mel Waters ever residing in or owning property in Kittyus County. <laughs> uh, All and, right. Yeah, and this was quite funny. So State Department of Natural Resources said the hole does not exist and geologically it's impossible. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> you know, yeah, so, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, because I remember Mel said that, like, you would throw something down it and you wouldn't hear right. anything. Ever. And if, if it was, even if it was thousands of feet deep, at some point, that sound would reverberate back up out the hole. It might take a little bit, but... Yeah, I mean, I just, I just can't see how a uh, a hole could be a completely straight shaft where you know, because any other object, I mean, if it's like they said geologically, there's there's got to be some kind of curvature or zigzag or something. But yeah, it was it still made a a great story and great entertainment. Oh, I when I first I was out snow blowing snow one day and I listened to it for the first time and I'm like, this is rather enthralling. I can see how mid '90s radio listeners would have been like, "This is this is something else." <laughs> yeah, back in a time when we weren't absolutely inundated with you know a million podcasts to choose from and all this stuff, like this would have been entertainment gold. Renegade says Mel's Hole was an analogy for the U.S. dollar. <laughs> That's good. Yep, he's on a roll tonight. So the next one we're going to talk about is JC, and for the record, this dude called in 30, at least 30 times over a 19-year span. And I put in parentheses, possibly the original troll. That's what I put there for my thoughts. So let's play a few, maybe a minute or two of this, and we'll see where we end up. Uh, hang on. Let's bring it up first before we do that. There we go. Ah, the crack of thunder. Back into the night we go. West of the Rockies, you're on the... Oh, wow. We're going to get this thing on. We're going to get an ad here, guys. Hey, I want to show you something that. real that quick. That is hilarious. Well, you're only yeah, good morning. It's, first of all, I want to say uh. that this Atlantis, this Atlantis business, yes. this is all the devil's deception. It is being propagated and, and perpetrated by people like you. Wait a minute. In the what? Media. Wait a minute. This is why I am against media pornography. Wait, 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 wait. This is wait, the wait, wait. Of, of, of the media. Wait, and, and wait, 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 wait. Let's have let's have an adult discussion about this. Now, <laughs> now look, if, if, if you, you're going to insulting me again. No, I'm not I'm insulting. You. I'm you trying to have a dialogue with you. Every time I talk to you, it's insultation from you. Oh, insultation? Uh, let me tell you something. I say, could never do half the job on you that you do on yourself. Now, listen to me for just <laughs> one moment, would you please? I'm listening. All right, good. If science finds through um, uh, the method science uses, which includes video cameras and all the rest of it, that there really is a city below the waters in Cuba. And yesterday we got evidence that there, indeed there is. I'll tell you what they're doing. I'll what? tell you what they're doing. The, what? People, the same pornographers that are creating that Star Trek Porn are doing this as special Pornographers. This is, this is, pornographers <laughs> did not <laughs> create Star Trek. Why is, would, haven't you ever Star Trek is one of my favorite it's a, programs. It's a very pornographic. It's pornographic. Star it's Trek? Just, yes. Star Trek is an icon of American science fiction. It is it's part of the media pornography that is assaulting our nation. Star Trek is just among it's it's terrible. If you've ever seen that show it, with it with a sixty nine or whatever. There we go. So, <laughs> oh boy. Go ahead, Carrie. You start. Well, so this guy has his own um, fandom entry on uh, the Coast to Coast fandom site. Um, Jonathan Christian Webster, I want to give him proper credit, uh, probably another invention of one of, 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 of somebody and, and it brilliantly done. I mean, just fantastic. Like a Simpsons character. He does. And I, and I think they might've taken like Ned Flanders and crossed him with something of the sort, like Ned on, uh, like he's on speed or something like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he represented, uh, Clamp which was the Christian Legion against media pornography. Oh. And that was, that was his thing. And 
let's just let's just say for a minute this is a real guy because i have met these kind of people before As maybe have not I. quite that intense but pretty close and um They're to art's credit moment. yep yep to art's credit like he still managed like anybody else would just hung up on the guy yes. but art knew it was good radio and so he fed it and uh, and it was and it was epic he uh what, what does uh john willis say don't feed the trolls so uh i but i think art knew how to just give him enough if, if you know enough breadcrumbs to hang himself and have mm -hmm. fun with it but you yeah. rarely did art ever get as upset as he sounds there and and it could be totally you know it could be put on but <clears throat> He rarely, rarely ever spoke over a guest. And I really appreciated that because, yeah, yeah but this was fun because you, you could tell as soon as JC comes on, you could hear it in Art's voice and you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I have met people like him and I really think, I know Art only passed, what's it been, five or six years now? Maybe 20 years. Yeah, 2018. But he was kind of, you know, he was still doing his show, but I think he would have had a lot of fun with people, even, you know, the last three or four years, some of the crazy crackpots that have just come right out of left field. I think he would have had a lot of fun with a lot of them. Yep. And Byron says, don't argue, with, uh, don't argue with idiots online. Well, uh, Art made a living at it at times, or at least discussing with them, right? He did. <laughs> Renegade, to, Renegade said, I'm pretty sure I met that guy at Float Fest, or at least, at very least, a dude's spirit animal. And I missed another good one here. Jace, um, Sean says, JC still calls into George Norrie. Yeah, wow. on the fandom site, they have a list of, um, if not the episode number, at least like the number of times per year that he has called into the show, and he is still at it today. Or somebody portraying that character. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Haas says, Art Bell rocked the AM waves. Listened to him for years when I worked nights. He used to cover politics and started the paranormal stuff. Sounds like Haas was around listening to him from way back. Nice. But yeah, so um, I, your notes here, you put that uh, JC was an odd duck and he called in many times, spouting all kinds of religious viewpoints, argumentative and talked over Art all the time. And he picked, apparently I didn't catch this, but he used to pick fights with guests too, did he? Yeah, so if Art was interviewing somebody and then they go to the call-in segment and JC would come through and he would just rip them a fresh one uh, all the time over, usually it was, it media pornography was his thing. He didn't care for people who, um, you know, were in same-sex relationships. He didn't care. any Anything that the far, um, the, uh, what's my word here, that the ultra conservatives don't care for, that was JC's platform. So if you were easily offended, he probably was not the guy to listen to. So he would have been a placeholder for Joe conservative or Joe ultra conservative, eh? Yeah. And well, I mean, he was, and, and, and that was an extreme example too, because, right. you know, in, in my um, experience of conservatism around here, it's nothing like that. It's more like, eh, okay. I'm not crazy about it, but whatever kind of attitude yes and it's fun to you know I, I i keep telling the same story but i, I the other day i went in i went on to facebook and somebody was talking about all the bullshit we dealt with over the last couple of years and i thought yeah that's legit and then the very next line they start talking about flat earth and i'm like see see <laughs> like, and you wonder why when we question things that happen on a regular basis people call us crackpots anyway uh, that's the rest of my soapbox for tonight. So uh, Sean Ryan said, JC actually co-hosted the show with Art three times. See, this no is... No way. We'll to, you know what, Sean? <laughs> Maybe we'll have to get Sean on with us some night. He knows a lot. He uh, knows his stuff. Yeah. yeah. We need a part two. Yeah. Oh, we'll do it. Yeah, there's so much. So, okay. The next one is one that you, that I picked, uh, Carrie. Sweet. So this is the man who flew over Area 51. Yeah. Have you ever have you heard that one? Yeah, I love this okay. one. Yeah, it's fun. So I uh, I just picked. I kind of have it set right where. So to set the stage for you guys, this guy's girlfriend sent a fax in because Art used to communicate via fax. I know that's crazy to think of. And uh, 
she said he was trying to get a hold of him and he's in a little Cessna. The, the way it sounds, it almost sounds like he built the Cessna himself or something. It's a very believable sounding call. And apparently he, yeah. So let's, let's pick it up right there. Let's bring this up and whoops, sorry, Carrie made you disappear. And here we go. Uh, yes, sir. Where are you? Well, I'm up here from Fort Worth in my little airplane. It's a long sea I built myself. It's a bird room can design with the Ford Canard. I'm not sure if you know the kind. It's an experimental aircraft. You know, I'm not... surprised that, but not anymore. No, tell me about it. What kind of airplane is it? Well, it's a long easy. It's got 120 horsepower, like homing in it, but we had it more and stroked and fixed it up a little bit. It uh, usually flies around 140, 160 indicated eight. And I figure I'll just uh, go on up here and uh, try to get into this Area 51. I'm right south of this Nevada Test Line, or Dallas Air Force Base. Listen. And I'm right outside this restricted zone. Listen. Let's just baby up a little bit here. Let's do that. Let's crank this thing on up. We got some pretty good mountains here off to my uh, west, don't you know? All right, jump ahead a little. Why, why are you doing it at night? Because that's the best way to get in here. But even if you manage, even if you manage to overfly the area, what? I'm in the restricted zone. I just entered the restricted zone. I see a bunch of lights out there. Looks like some kind of a search light coming on. You're so there. So <laughs> it won't play too much, just so we don't maybe anyway. So apparently he got shot down eventually. At least that's how the story goes. Is it, Carrie? That's how it sounds. He at one point later in the call he says he's got two fighter jets alongside him that are doing like the you need to land or turn around or whatever the guy reminds me of um cousin Eddie, you know cousin eddie um who played cousin eddie in the oh from uh independence day independence day right yes. he yes. sounds like you know a, a, a drunk crop duster who's just out randy, have some fun. randy yep. quaid yes yep so who knows you know this would have been pre-independence day i think but anyway i think so yeah yeah so if it was real, it was very believable, but it sounds like the guy's on, a, you know, uh, an, an airplane radio with lots of noise in the background and him and Art are going back and forth and Art's like, why are you so stupid? You're over Area 51 at night in a homemade uh, airplane or a, a home built airplane. What, what are you trying to prove? And then the guy just kind of, you know, stuck in his ways like this is what I'm going to do. And uh, Renegade says flying into restricted airspace is generally a bad idea. And from what we can tell, uh, it sounds to me like um, he was dispatched at the end. Is that what they say? Yeah, because or... it, like, it just cuts out. Like he, he kind of starts to panic and then it's, you know, it's just static. And um, like Art tries to call him back and reconnect and, and can't and. It just kind of leaves you wondering. Makes for good good theater, if nothing else, right? Yeah, and you know, let's let's go with you know, if Area Fifty One is a real thing, it's not like it would be reported in the news that some little aircraft was shot down in Nevada, so or New Mexico or wherever they are. So, so the last clip I just played beneath it, there is a context. You know how lots of videos have context warnings now. So it says uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and then it gives a an article about what Area 51 actually is. So <laughs> that tells you something interesting because back in my, you know, back in the X Files days and a little even pre pre X Files, I was always very interested in Area 51. To me, I think of all things, that was one of the most intriguing areas I'd ever heard of. You know? Oh yeah. And uh, Haas says Linda Howell was very popular on his shows too she always covered the paranormal I yeah she know. was bringing up the um the, the whole cattle mutilation thing she was known for reporting on that and i listened to one not long ago i think she traveled quite a bit too didn't she yeah because, she would be all over the world yeah i remember she was in uh at least according uh, yeah you know <laughs> according to the story you know according to her uh, report she was in england checking out crop circles at the time yep so Renegade says, I wonder if Art ever covered the Killdozer incident. That would be interesting. I don't know, but that's easy enough to try to search. Well, that's what I was just thinking, because it would be, yeah, I don't know if he, uh, well, we'll do some digging. If anybody has any requests for topics that Art covered, 
for the next show because we're going to do another one of these, I'm sure. And oh, uh, Sean says Linda has a podcast on YouTube every Wednesday night. I think it's called Earth Flies. Well, she might be an interesting guest to get on the show sometime. That would cool. be fun. I didn't know if she was still reporting. So let's go with this next one. I'm going to bring it up here. Give me a second. Um, this is called Sounds from Hell. Have you heard this before, Carrie? This is on that same CD that the Mel's Hole. I kind of think. Yeah, this so th is, but this is this is great, and it, it gives me the creeps. But yeah, I'm all about it. So I just I want to preface this that, and and Art prefaces it as well that if you know if if weird, creepy sounding things scare you, please turn off your podcast right now and go home and talk to your mummy because it could get a little scary for just a minute. But this is, um, so if you've heard of this, the capped well, I guess the Russians at one time attempted to drill the world's deepest hole for some reason. It's in Siberia. And as the story goes, they open it up and they record the sounds that come out of it. This is like third hand tape recordings. But for all of you out there who want something very entertaining, hang in there. So, um, I guess if a person ever pictured what hell would sound like, I think um, that might be it. I'd it's, say it's pretty accurate. That's creepy as hell. I'm so pardon the pun, but that is creepy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Renegade Butcher says that's just early recordings of Katy Perry <laughs> played in reverse. Fair enough. That's before they apply auto tune. Yeah. Yes, that was back when she was still a gospel singer. So, um, what do you think of that? Oh, I mean, I remember when I when I put that CD in, and I probably played it in um, in my uh, the portable player, the the Walkman version. Um, I was, you know, kind of still doing the church thing then, and I was like, "Well, that's enough of that." Like, I just kind yeah. of felt like, like I just like, nope, not gonna open that door. Uh, still creepy. That that hasn't changed. Like it. It gave me chills. So um, it's still whether, creepy, even yeah, if it's I mean, something that was made. It, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, if, even if it was fake, still <laughs> emotional reaction has been uh, has been has, has happened. Yeah. And there's okay. So that clip was two minutes and forty seven seconds. The reason I wanted to play the entire thing was to kind of show how much of art, how much of a showman art was, because he spent two minutes and about fifteen seconds building up a 30 second clip. Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, Alfred Hitchcock used to say that the monster you don't see is scarier than the monster you do. Mm -hmm. And so he spent, you know, almost two and a half minutes building up, building the tension. And, you know, it was scary as hell when you listen to it, but the fact that he took all that time to put you in the right state emotionally was, uh, definitely helps when it comes to that. Absolutely. And I, and to create a plausible backstory, you know, I because we all knew somebody somewhere that either had a VHS tape. You remember, remember like Faces of Death and that kind of stuff? People would make copies of oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Or, um, you know, or in the early days of the internet, there used to be like, uh, of course, I, I had audio copies of some of the early Celebrity Jeopardy skits. Or um, there was that radio skit where the lady called in and she, how was it? Um, she wanted to have the, the deer crossing moved because it was in a bad spot. You know, there was all those early, they, you know, and they'd be a recording of a recording that would get passed on. And yep. for any any uh, Gen Zs or millennials out there, the, there was those things called cassette tapes that we used to dub and uh, they would get worse with every copy. <laughs> so and then this is, you know, who knows how many times that was recorded and compressed and then, you know, sent through the pipelines and then you guys hear it again through the air. So, yeah, it's cool. I just yeah. the mythology behind it. I enjoyed a lot. So from that, I had, there was, so one story I looked for tonight that I couldn't find, and it reminded me of, oh shoot, it was, um, there was a movie in the 
early 2000s called Frequency, where a girl makes contact with her dad over the radio. And this story was really cool. Not too often, Art would, would read emails or faxes he would get from people. Usually he wanted to get people to call in live. But this was a cool story. And basically the idea was her dad was always into ham and he passed away and she came home and she wanted to learn how to use his ham radio gear. And she had somebody show him and she'd gotten on and she talked to two or three of his contacts and they had all told them that they had talked to him that week. And of course she said, well, that's impossible. My dad's been dead for two or three weeks now. Right. And I, it was such a, a warm hearted story, but it still had that creep value to it as well. Yeah. And, uh, if I can find that guys, I will, um, either I'll, I'll get a printout of it and read it myself, or I'll play some of the excerpts in the next, the next episode we do, you know? And, uh, Renegade said the ring just wouldn't have had the same vibe with the secondhand VHS without, I think he means without the secondhand VHS cassette element. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, Haas said, uh, his annual Halloween show was awesome. Made it pretty scary listening. Yes. Ghost to ghost was just awesome. Oh, they were great. And yes, uh, Haas said art was a ham as well. He would go on the airwaves sometimes after the show. Yeah. I, I thought that was kind of neat. So the next one we have is Dr. Doom, or better known as um, Major Ed Dames. Is that right? Yeah, Major Ed Dames. Okay. Now, this one's audio only. It's all I could find. Um, I hope it plays properly here, but we'll we'll bring it up. And we won't even... Yeah, here we go. Let's see. And, uh, and, we, and we can... Anyway, we proceed along the, using these protocols in a very structured manner. We're to the point where we, we can do accurate, very accurate drawings, distances, directions, vectors of a target. We can do clay models of a person, a place, a facility, those kinds of things, an object. For instance, right now we're modeling for a, uh, a federal agency the, the next set of bombs that the Unabomber is making uh, to use against uh, civilians. Wow. So that kind of thing. Um, That's what my company, SciTech, is doing now. In the research at SciTech, uh, or in that government work you did, mm -hmm. um, was there ever any research into whether the target uh, at any point becomes aware in any way or uh, of any change, uh, discomfort, uh, probing, uh, uh, aware in any way that he or she is a target? There have, if, if the target happens to be a natural like somebody that's very gifted, a very gifted natural. And we all have this faculty. It's innate. It just has to be trained to be useful. And there was no structure or grammar, if you will, until the discovery was made. If a trained remote viewer or a natural psychic happens to be the... All right. So this guy was a remote viewer. Apparently, he used to work for the government or the CIA, something like that, Kerry. Yeah, um, I can't remember if the CIA or the NSA, but one of those three-letter agencies that spies for a living. <laughs> yes, some kind of al alphabet agency, right? So yeah. Sean Ryan says some guy, same guy, or some guy called in was able to tell Art the exact layout of his studio via, via remote viewing. Wow. So, you know, that could have been literally remote viewing with a webcam, or it could have been somebody who knew, or it could have been somebody who was... Maybe legit at it, right? So, yeah, he said he was U.S. military trained. Um, so here's the thing. Ed, when I dug into him quite a bit, he reminded me quite a bit of a lot of the TV evangelists that I listened to growing up or that were in the background. Yeah, uh, Do you remember Jack Van Impey? I don't know if you do or not. but mm, that one right here, I think he's probably still on TV. I don't know. But anyway, he predicted the end of the world every single week he was constantly the rapture is going to happen jesus is coming back this that the other it was all constant it never stopped period ever and uh oh sean says it was before webcam so that makes sense yeah um but yeah he reminds me of those guys or uh there was a guy named edgar weisen weisen Ant, who wrote 88 reasons why the rapture would happen in 1988 um that didn't really, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, age very well? <laughs> no, if it did, not too many people got raptured. So No, maybe we were just yeah. so um, Maybe we got left evil. behind. Yeah, you know. Yeah. 
And now, and I'm not saying that the dude wasn't involved in some crazy shit. Like Renegade said, the CIA was doing some serious research into that shit, and there's tons of declassified documents showing some freaky shit, which is cool. I, man, if somebody like he he goes on to talk about, uh, well, you heard in there, um, the Unabomber and how mm -hmm. they they were remote viewing on him, and this episode was written in or was recorded in December of '95. And the Unabomber was caught in April of 96. So there's only about four months between it. And he never had a chance to let off another bomb. But there was a bomb in 95 that put him back in the consciousness of everyone, right? So it was something, who knows, maybe they were. I mean, you know, if I was desperate as a an FBI CIA agent, I'd probably try something like that too, just to see what would happen, right? Yeah, and remote viewing is actually at this point pretty much considered to be like a thing like it's really well documented um it is it is a, a a teachable skill like all that is accurate and i've actually read a number of books on the topic i've read biographies of people who were in these programs and then in like later incarnations of it um okay. joe mcmonagle is one and art actually interviewed him and there's another fella um david morehouse i can see the book on my shelf right now Nice. David Morehouse, very interesting guy, very interesting book. Um, so, like, it, it is a thing. Uh, and this is kind of where, you know, Carrie gets weird. We are able to perceive things beyond what we use our five senses for. Um, so, and and just like anything, you know, is if the military can can uh, figure that out and put it to work for their own purposes, then, then they will. And they did, and I'm sure that they still do, and it's probably more advanced than ever. Um, the thing about Ed is he's mostly full of it. Um, That's the and problem. Yes. There's a lot of evidence that he was not nearly as um, as high up in the program as he led people to believe. And there's been a lot of claims against him for fraud and things like that. So he ended up his first. Yeah, so he, yeah I, I did some more digging. He he I, has he passed? No, he's still is he still around? He's still at it. Yeah. His website is active. Yeah, it's called. Remote RV or something RV now. Uh, learn RV. Learn RV because his original business, his co-founder sued him for 400 and some thousand. He yep. lost the case, had to pay the money. His ex-wife took over the business. He started a new business and then uh, changed it to learn remote viewing. Now, of course, I have no problem with um, capitalism and people making money, but it is one of those things that apparently it's rather expensive to learn. Um, now, the proof's in the pudding when people make predictions. And he predicted the kill shot in 2011 or 2012 when everybody was scared of the Mayans. He thought there was going to be a huge coronal mass ejection that was going to basically wipe us all off the planet. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen. I guess he changed his mind and said it was coming at some point in the near future. So there's that. He keeps, he keeps pushing it out. Yep. Yes. And I even found an old Twitter comment from Joe Rogan in 2013 about uh, Ed. And uh, even Joe Rogan seemed slightly, uh, un not unimpressed, but didn't quite seem convinced. You know, he, he talked about the documentary and he's like, hey, everybody's got to check this out. And then he's like, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> and if Joe Rogan says that, I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. But an interesting dude nonetheless. And... Uh, you know, on the subreddit, he was probably one of the least liked um, guests on there. Everybody called him uh, boring or dull. Like he, and he does. He doesn't. He doesn't have much of a uh, personality, right? Yeah, he has no affect in his voice, and he seems to. People who are ultra self assured to me are not very interesting, and that's how he always comes across. As there's just no possible way he could be wrong, and like, well, that's boring. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? And you're right. Yeah. yeah. Because when they're absolute, when they 100% are either in love or believe their own shit that much, then it's like, well, okay, I guess we'll, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's, if there's no room for debate or comparison or learning in the conversation, then what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Uh, Renegade says the brain is a bundle of nerves that sends and receives electrical signals. The more you learn about radio waves, the more you start to see why it's not that bizarre of an idea but there are nuts. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Like uh, John Bush the other day had a good Facebook post about crypto and how crypto itself 
is a great technology, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and that sort of thing. But the problem is, is that there is a metric shit ton of scam artists involved in the crypto space right now. Mm -hmm. And of course, whenever that happens, you know, I mean, take a guy like Alex Jones, for instance, and I'm, I'm, I'm treading lightly here because I'm sure there's lots of people out there who love the dude. You know, um, I'm sure Alex Jones has gotten many things right over the years. But the problem is, is that the things he gets wrong puts him in the limelight and everybody sees him for it. Right. Yeah. And that and that paints you in modern times as a pariah. Right. And I get it. So uh, Sean Ryan says the interviews with Father Malachi Martin were awesome. I'm glad Sean brought that up. So I've got a I've got a quick story about listening to this guy on night shift on the ambulance. Hmm. So he, he was a priest uh, who performed exorcisms and they would sometimes record, I guess, audio record these, these exorcisms. Right. And I'm already like, I, I actually don't really care for too many horror films. I'm actually kind of a big baby when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, and, and there's something about the whole demonic thing that, literally like it scares the absolute piss out of me because i think it's it's probably real like there's a lot of stuff i doubt but i think that's probably real and i've also like been around people that gave me a terrible terrible feeling sure so um but anyway one night i'm on the truck with um uh, with my paramedic partner and this guy was a little bit older than me and he was basically like opie from the andy griffin show like he was literally <laughs> the most um he even looked like ron howard he okay. was the most like happy-go-lucky like everything was nice everything was fine he never got irritated he never was grumpy he never said an ill word about any patient or staff member which be real guys like we all bitched about everything on that on that truck but anyhow i turn on coast to coast and it was probably a rerun show because at this time the art wasn't actually um on the show live anymore, but they would run on Saturdays and Sundays. They would run uh, reruns of sure. our soul show because they were better than George. Um, <laughs> That's a bad. And, song. Yeah. So, so Dr. Martin's on there and he's telling his story and then they go to the part where they're going they're, where they're playing the clips of these exorcisms and you hear that demonic voice, the one that just makes yes. you feel not good at all. And after about 30 seconds of that, my partner reached over and just punched the radio off. And he was like, I'm sorry, but I can't handle any more of that. And I was like, okay. Cause I was kind of like, I'm going to grin and bear this. Like, this is crazy. This is freaking me out, but I'm going to listen to it. It's, you know, 2 AM we're sitting downtown. It was probably like a creepy fall night anyhow. And he was like, Mr. Happy go lucky was like, Nope, can't do it. So that, is that made awesome. an impression on me. Yeah. And for a dude who, nothing seemed to bother was that the idea yeah he would just he came across as like um just super super happy-go-lucky okay um he was just kind of like you weren't sure if he was like full of it and that was just a facade that he put on to get through the shift but because you ever around one of those people is like there's no way they're actually that nice yes like like tim you're a nice guy and you you seem to have a pretty pretty good demeanor but i bet you get pissed off at some shit and i bet you've like walloped something that has a carburetor before because it wouldn't freaking start so I've, I've put a hole in the wall on a couple of occasions in my life so yeah yeah absolutely. same same here but this guy was like is he actually that nice or is it just an act but at any rate he couldn't handle um demons on the radio they Sean, were scary yeah yeah and we'll, you know what on the next time, we have, it might be two or three months before we do another one, but the next time we do one, we'll, we'll get a, a bit of his in there. And then there was, uh, what was her name? Was her name Harlot? Harlot the, the Witch. Yes. That was different. Yeah. It wasn't as scary as I thought, but it was still very much um, odd. Hey? That lady should have been, if she wasn't actually an actress calling into that show, she should have been because she was that good. Um. Renegade wanted to know if I apologize to the wall being a fellow or being be, being a, a polite Canadian. So uh probably said something worse than that at the time. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, she was um, and she she was, yeah, she was crazy. Absolutely yeah. crazy. Sean yeah. said Harlot was legit. Yeah, I think I think she was interviewed. Man, was it in other instances or something like that? I can't remember, but 
So there was, when you were talking about being in the ambulance, that reminded me of another ghost to ghost story. He had a guy come on there who used to uh, deliver bodies to the morgue or take them to the funeral home from the morgue. Mm. And the one story he told, I, I mean, if the guy was full of shit, I don't know. But he basically talked about how, see, you know, the guy was in a, you know, whatever, a body bag or whatever. And his spirit. Had a lot. He just Let's lose our. All right, I think we're good. I'm going to keep talking. I don't know what just happened. Okay. Got all choppy on my end, but you're coming through now. Uh, you there? Sorry, guys. I let's give it one more shot. Um, anybody? Back. All right. All right. In here. You're just really you're real choppy on my end, Tim. Guys, my end here. So I'm gonna try. This is yeah. JS head. Josh Sloan just said it's alien. It's still pretty choppy. There we go. All right, we're going to try to see if we can get, I have no idea why all of a sudden my, my internet went crazy, but uh, yeah, CSIS, absolutely. So we have one, ep one um, can you hear me now, Carrie? Yeah, yeah, your video okay. is a little, oh, you're coming through good now. All right, all right. go for well, it. You know, you know what, I might just, uh, here, hang on um i don't know anyway let's go from here we'll try it we're gonna see we're gonna try to get through one more here guys i will edit that out in the uh for anybody listening to the audio maybe you won't end up hearing about it so i don't know what's going on i have a hardwired connection here and i still sometimes get a wi-fi signal so something's going on so anyway guys i apologize it wasn't planned it was not the uh area 51 call-in uh outage but i think it might have been aliens or uh CSIS is the canadian version of uh the FBI and CIA up here. So I think it was maybe them trying to get us. Uh, yeah. Uh, Martinson family said the GD libtards don't want us to get this, the uh, message out. So there you go. So I appreciate that. Um, all right. So the last one we're going to cover guys is Madman Markham and uh, interesting dude. Hey, Carrie. Uh, yeah. This guy was quite the trip to listen to. I have no, I, yeah. Anyway, so we'll, I'll fill you in a little bit on his background afterwards. Uh, Rachel said, Tim beat the demons trying to stop the show. So far, we're good. If if it cuts out, guys, I apologize. Uh, weather's good here, so let's play it. Hang on, I'll bring this up. And uh, yeah, let's have fun with it. A secret location somewhere in the country and say, Mike, welcome to Midnight in the Desert. Yeah, it's been, uh, been a long time, Art. <laughs> a long time 18 20 years ago right the first interview and then 18 years ago yep something like that something like that all right uh gee mike it's hard to know where to begin with you even back then it was hard um you connected i think with us probably we were doing an, like an open lines thing on time travel is that how we got together um it's been so long i hardly remember that was probably uh, it I thought I remember right. Somebody faxed you a, a newspaper article, oh, and right. then you right. basically hunted right. me down. So that's right. I hunted you down like a dog. Okay. Um, so at that moment, when I found you 
uh, Mike, and and I, and I do. You know, I use the term madman affectionately, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't bother me any. So it's kind of stuck, though, huh? Yep. Yeah. Um. So. Anyway, well earned, really. Um, when I found you at that moment, you were experimenting the beginnings of experimental uh, time travel, and you sort of laid it out for me. So if you can remember how you began, tell me. Tell us. Uh, um, well, back, way back when, basically, I, um, I just originally I just set out to make a fancy Jacob's Ladder. So basically, two minutes, well, everybody... Uh, two metal rods spark going up the mid- high voltage spark going up the middle. That's basically like the old uh, Frankenstein movies or whatever. Right. But, that uh, that was the first step. And I, if I recall correctly, you then modified it with lasers. To- yeah, basically. Uh, All right. So that that was him. Um, I don't want to go too long into the show with him rattling on. But the idea was he built a Jacob's Ladder, which is basically two metal poles running a big transformer at the bottom. And when you see it, it looks like the old Frankenstein thing where these um, electrical pulses kind of go up and then out at the top. Story goes that he took a sheet metal screw, for whatever reason, threw it into those electrical pulses. It disappeared and then reappeared three to four seconds later across the room. Now, I mean, take with it what you will, but he, for whatever reason, decided that he had invented time travel at that moment. So he tried to turn the power up a little more. It burned up. So he thought, well, what do we need to do? I'm a broke college student. So him and his buddies went and stole a bunch of 300 pound transformers from a local power yard, built one. When they fired it up, apparently the way the story goes, that it put out the entire power in his whole town. The sheriff showed up because some loud noise at his place, discovered the stolen property, and he spent some time in jail. And then, as the story goes, uh, there was a, um, doesn't seem plausible, considering he was on Art's show a couple of times, 20 years apart, but some people say he disappeared in 1997 for a long time. And then there was a story that he ended up dead in the 1930s with a cell phone next to him. Take that for what you will. But the more I dug... I found him recently, as recent as February of this year, posting in an online forum talking about how he was getting ready to build another time machine. <laughs> yep, I found that same post and a Facebook account too, which yeah. could belong to anybody, but you know, it was there. Same thing. He was basically running a GoFundMe. Right. So, which probably would have been very um, advantageous back in the day when he was doing it because he could have built a bigger Maybe time he wouldn't machine. have to steal. Yeah. So what'd you think of him? I mean, time travel has always been fascinating to me. It was always my favorite topic on like the Star Trek shows and stuff like that. And it just, it really bends your brain, you know? So he was interesting. Um, And one of the things that made it sound more legit was, I think it was, I can't remember if it was the first or the second time that he called into art. But when they went to um, people calling in to talk, to him the arresting officer called in really i'll have to see if i can find that episode and send it to you because um he calls in and you can tell that markham is like that if it was pre-planned man they really pulled it off because he was kind of like because he was young, like he was 21, and, and he was really weirded out by the fact that the officer called in. And the officer was very nice and everything, and, and, but he cor- you know, corroborated everything that had been said up to that point. So that was, that was kind of one of those you know, kind of confirmation moments of, mate, this guy did something. I don't know if he time traveled, but he did something pretty bizarre. I think, in my mind, I kind of put him in the same category as, as Ed Dames or, or the harlot we talked about earlier, whether take them or leave them, they 100% believed in what they said. They weren't, those three at least weren't actors. They weren't mm-hmm. putting on a show. They 100% believed in what they did. And uh, my brother-in-law, he just come on. He said, if he could time travel, he said, why didn't he go back in time and win lotto? So here's the thing. And this is what made me chuckle. Madman said, 
that he, for whatever reason, he could only time travel into the future slightly, or at least that's what he planned. Now, when I read that, I was reminded, do you remember Mad TV in the 90s, Gary? I watched a little bit, yeah. I loved it. I was a huge Mad TV fan, way more than Saturday Night Live. And they did a skit in there way back in the day where this scientist called in the news and he's like, I have invented a time machine. He said, I can only go in the future for about eight hours at a time. He said, come into my lab and I'll show you what I have. And they go in there and he pulls the curtain back and it's a bed. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just, it, I don't, it reminded yeah. me of that when he said I can only go into the future. So yeah, yeah. it was fun. I, I love it. I mean, again, um, when we talk about all of the the people who were on here, um, most weren't disingenuous. And the cool thing was on some of the ghost to ghost episodes were if Art suspected that it was a kid or a young guy making up a story, having a laugh at his expense, he would cut them off quick and just be gone because mm -hmm. he, whatever he covered, he wanted it to be covered seriously and, um, and honestly, earnestly maybe would be the right term. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, he had a, um, a quick hand for the, for the eject button, especially since he, he didn't scream for most of that time. And I remember especially one thing that made an impression on me when they would do the New Year's Eve prediction shows where everybody, audience members would just call in. And But Art had rules after a some incidents. He said, no, um, do not predict the death of any head of state of any country. Oh. Because, when that, because when people have done that before, he said, people in black suits show up at my house knocking on the door wanting to know how I know about such and such person is, is allegedly going to be assassinated, you know? So he, he said, don't talk about celebrity death, political death, anything like that. Everything else was a free for all. And those were, those new year's Eve shows are great. That's yeah. Um, so it just reminded me of something here. I just, just read this article the other day. And I'm gonna see, whoops, we got some up there. So recently there was a guy, who has run an Area 51 website since the mid-90s. It may even predate back to like the BBS days, I'm not sure. And his house was recently raided by men in black suits um, without giving him any reason for it. He suspects it may have been some sort of new airplane that he got pictures of and posted on the internet. But he's basically doing a GoFundMe because they took all his gear and now he's up a creek and he talked to a lawyer and he's like, if you ever get it back, the computers will be out of date by the time you get them. Wow. I'll, uh, I'll bring up, uh, I'll, I'll find the story some night and we'll, uh, we'll discuss it. But so what do you, what do you, uh, what, <laughs> yeah. Renegade just said, did uh, Tim accidentally just queue up his only fans audio track? No, unfortunately <laughs> it was a, uh, <laughs> um, uh, what do you call it? A commercial for StreamYard. They have the most pornish, um soundtrack you're ever going to get so oh man so what do you so, think oh go ahead carrie yeah i was just going to mention how you know art show he, it launched the careers of a lot of other people who have continued in radio podcast format um apparently linda moulton howe is one and i, I didn't know she was still at it so i'm definitely going to see what she's up to these days but um richard hoagland which was known for his space reporting and the stuff with mars he has his own show Right. Um, called The Other Side of Midnight. Um, I don't know if it's on like terrestrial radio or if it's internet based at this point. Um, Whitley Strieber still does uh, Dreamland. Right. And there's a, there's a few more out there. So, you know, just much in the way where, you know, you took spearco's concept and you've turned it into your own thing and and, and so many people have so um in, in a lot of ways like his work lives on in that format which is which is pretty nice that's cool i <laughs> i don't think i could sum it up any better than that i we, we've talked about it over the years but um I, lately i've been thinking about how much content is out there and how much you know we've basically for the last 10 to 12 decades, let's say the last hundred years have been a content creation 
um, society, whether, you know, whether it's radio, TV, books, movie, music. And if all of content stopped being created tomorrow, there would still be more than enough content out there to consume for the rest of a hundred lifetimes. And you still wouldn't hear it all. Mm -hmm. But, but we all still create because there's a need for it. There's a hunger for it. And it seems to be in the hum in a human's nature to create for whatever reason that is. And I think that when you're talking about art and it would be kind of neat to, 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 to go, you know, you go all the way back to where he started in, I think it was in Korea in the sixties or seventies. Mm-hmm. And he, he claimed way back then that he set the Guinness book world records for being on the air for the longest time. But you think about where he started and where he ended up in Harumph, Nevada in 2018 and how many people he touched over all those years and how many creators or radio hosts or whatever all exist now simply because he decided to get on a microphone and start hollering way back in the day. Hey, yeah. And people just, people just thought it was cool. And he set a heck of an example. And when you pull up those old YouTube videos, every single comment is positive. Everyone is praising him. Everyone on is saying like rest in peace and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I was, I was stunned when he passed away and, uh, it's it, you know because even though he was sort of mostly officially fired at that point i don't think he was really doing any radio or internet but um it was you know i don't really i'm not usually one of these types that's like bothered by like celebrity death or whatever but that kind of that was a little bit of a gut punch because he was just such a unique voice in that field um there's there's not going to be anybody else like him and and that's all right true story i mean you look at george snurry and you know i haven't listened to the man so i don't want to judge him but i can i can share what i've heard from other people and you know it sounds like he's uh maybe a pale a pale imitation to to some extent and uh and there so um renegade says art was a showman but he was always 100 percent a class act you know mm-hmm. and even the small little i don't know controversies that followed him they just were what they were. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And art, you know, I, I love it. You see all the old time. I love anytime you see a picture, almost always it's, it's an old radio gear and he's got his damn cigarette in his mouth. He's got you know? a cigarette. Yep. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, it's, I'm sure, well, it seems like the cigarettes are what killed him eventually, but he still lived to, you know, his early seventies, which isn't as bad as what it could have been. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, and he had, you know, he had remarried after his wife had passed away, and he had a daughter. Um, he's got several kids, actually. Um, had a had a few wives too, but yeah. hey, you know, the man lived a full life, and uh, you know, I'm 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 not going to pass judge on, on judgment on anybody who who followed their dream and and made the kind of impact that he did. He seemed to have a a good heart, and to kind of have his heart in the right spot. So I admired that. One more thought I have, and it's something I've been dealing with a lot lately, and I've come to the conclusion that in life, if you want to be great at something, you have to commit to that one thing, and you have to commit to it for a lifetime. Because if you want to do a whole bunch of things, that's fine. But if you want to be remembered for something you do, you have to be passionate, committed, and almost obsessed with it. And you know, I mean, art left a legacy behind. Uh, I think it would be a lot of fun to put either a documentary or a biography together on the man. But mm-hmm. he is an exact example of committing yourself your entire adult life to something and leaving a footprint behind that will be remembered, hopefully, for decades, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, as long as we have digital media. I mean, he's he's going to keep influencing new generations. And that, you know, that that word, you know, his his influence is just going to keep kind of dispersing through society. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Brown, we've been an hour and a half. So uh, anybody want to check up with you? Where do they find you, brother? brother? Uh, strongrootsresources.com is the website and strongrootsresources at gmail.com. If you want to shoot me an email, I am happily helping a number of people with some um, edible landscape and homestead design. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh uh, some of them, not so much. No, they're, everybody's great. I've only got one person who's wearing me out right now. She just has a lot of questions, and that's okay because she hired me to answer her questions. Perfect. Um, 
but uh, yeah, that's how they can find me. Well, thank you, Carrie. Uh, Carrie's going to be helping me uh, with, um, well, my uh, a good buddy of ours, Brian Alexovich from the Lots Project as well. But my wife and I just bought 10 acres down in Tennessee, and uh, Carrie's going to help us uh, build our off-grid paradise down there. So I'm quite excited about that. And I uh, uh, just wanted to say thank you. Uh, the new name I've seen in here a lot tonight was Sean Ryan. I really appreciate you. Um, just warning, uh, uh, you know, this show's all over the place, you know, preparedness, um, home maintenance, living on, you know, living off the grid, all kinds of cool things. So it's good to have you. I appreciate it. Always love seeing new faces in here. And uh, it's fun, isn't it, Carrie, doing some of these off the wall episodes where we can just kind of dig deep into something? Oh, yeah, this it's it's a great format. I'm all about it. And last time I had Carrie on, we talked about the Ferengi rules of acquisition. So, uh, geez, <laughs> you just never know what we're going to talk about. Hey, no, no, we're, we're going to nerd out on something. That's for sure. Appreciate it. Well, folks, we thank you for coming in once again. And uh, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, keep looking at the skies. <laughs>